well, thank you for joining me today for Real Estate with Engineer You. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black. And today I want to talk to you on part two of Everybody Has a Red Seated Cross. And I'm coming to you from my book, Valley of Dry Bones Live Again, Rebuilding the Walls of Your Torn Down Life. It's available on the websites at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to continue with uh, part two. Now, just to let you know what how we concluded the last episode, Pharaoh's firstborn was the last of the plagues that, Jesus, that God brought upon Pharaoh. And finally, he, Pharaoh let God's people go. Okay? Now, when the word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind. What have we done letting all those Israelite slaves get away, they replied. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egyptians' best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so he chased after the people of Israel, who had left with fists raised in defiance. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces of the Pharaoh's army, and all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they camped beside the shore near Piharath, Piharath, across from Baal Zephon. And Pharaoh approached the people of Israel, looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, Why do you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? The people of Israel said, complaining and bickering already. Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Here they praying to God, begging God to let them go to free them. God finally heard their cry, went and got Moses and Aaron and sent them to free them, caused all of these plagues and whatnot to come upon Pharaoh. Okay? And now they're talking about, uh, what have you done to us? See, that's how people are sometimes. They're ungrateful. How many of y'all know that? You know, you, they ask you for something and then you give it to them and they are just as ungrateful as all get out. That's why God don't like nobody who complains all the time. You have to be grateful for even little things. You might not be where you want to be, you know, but you're not where you used to be. Come on, somebody talk to me. So we have to be thankful for what we've got. Thankful for how far God has brought us so that he can take us just a little bit further. Don't ask him to take you all the way across to the promised land yet. Maybe that's where he will take you. But take it one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about right now. And don't complain because things are not the way they should be. Remember I talked about, you know, don't go by the way you feel. Go by what you know or it's not what it's looked like. Okay, those are other two messages you can listen to. <laughs> and we're going to find out what happened to the, some of the Israelites because they complained and bickered all the time. You probably know the story already. Now it says, they continue to say, to complain to Moses. Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Look at that. Ungrateful sons, man. I tell you. They're just so ungrateful it's pathetic, man. Make you just want to turn turn your nose up at them. You know, now you know this was, God was really getting angry at the people. He was really, really pissed. I mean, I can just imagine. You say that to me. You come asking me to free you and whatnot, and then you're going to turn around. Or you ask me to give you something or do something for you, and I'm good to you, you know, and then you're going to betray me like that or come out your mouth like that and say that to me, you know. Well, why don't I just make your dream and your wish come to reality then, you know? If you're going to complain like that, if that's what you really want, we can make it happen, okay? But Moses told the people, okay, Moses, was he was good. See, because a lot of us would have probably just went off and said, you ungrateful person. What? Get back out to the Pharaoh. Well, all of this that I done done for you, and you won't complain? But Moses was good. Moses kept his composure. He said, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. Whew. Now, that's a good word right there. And I'm going to say that to myself a lot. Don't, don't. Be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. Today. 
Not tomorrow. Tomorrow he'll rescue you today. Yesterday he rescued you today. Today he's going to rescue you today. Stand still. Don't be afraid. And watch the Lord rescue you today. Woo. In the name of Jesus. Now that's a powerful word right there. I can go on. Go on. on. <laughs> Alright. Now the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Ooh, that's a real word right there, huh? Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm, my brothers and sisters. Just stay calm. Now, that's some powerful word right there, ain't it? That's a powerful word. Okay? Now, nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. This is the Lord God. He rebuked the sea also, and it dried up. So he led them, led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Psalms 106, 8-10. See also Deuteronomy 5, 6. God's deliverance of Israel was a type of a Christian baptism. I mean, we're talking about going through water. Okay, you know, when you dunk in water, you're baptized. So it was a sort of a baptism, kind of, kind of, sort of. As God saves us from Satan and the death and frees us from slavery to sin. It's through the water. Okay, they may not have actually touched the water. They, they walked on dry ground, but the water was around them. Now, how is it that you're going to have so much confidence that these waters that have receded is going to stay receded while you go across it, but you don't have enough faith in God that he's going to bring, that he's going to do for you what he said he's going to do for you. But yet here you are crossing over on dry ground to sea. How many feet high is this water? It's still running. It's, you know, it hasn't stopped. It's still running. And you can feel the sprinkles coming on them as they're passing through the water. Okay, how you know that the water ain't going to recede and drown you right then and there? Okay, but moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses. In the cloud and in the sea. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 2. Okay. Uh, the importance of parting the Red Sea is that the one event of, uh, is the final act in God's deliverance, delivering his people from slavery in Egypt. It's a huge act. It's not his final act, but it's the final act in the Old Testament of delivering the people out of slavery. Which means that if he can deliver all those Israelites out of slavery, how many of y'all know that he can deliver us out of slavery too? Out of bondage. Okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, the exodus from Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea is the single greatest act of salvation in the Old Testament, and it is continually recalled to represent God's saving power. Okay, so we can relate that to what's going on with us today. The events of the Exodus, including the parting and the crossing of the Red Sea, are immortalized in the Psalms as Israel brings to remembrance God's saving works in their worship. For example, Psalm 66.6, 6, Psalm 78.13, Psalms 106.9, and Psalms 136.13. God prophesied to Adam that his descendants would become slaves in the foreign nation for 400 years. But God promised to deliver them. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. They had carried a load; they had all of the gold and the silver carrying, but they didn't have no way to spend it. And then it was still complaining. Okay. Now Genesis 15:14 is found there. The prophecy came to fulfillment uh, when many years after the death of Joseph, a pharaoh came in power to uh, came to power in Egypt who afflicted the people of Israel and enslaved them in Exodus 1, 8 to 11. It wasn't until after the birth of Moses that we read God heard the cries of his people and prepared to deliver them, Exodus 2, 20 through 25. The rest of the story is well known. Okay, but we're going to go over some of it here. Moses was commissioned by God to deliver his people. Brought, God brought Moses out of the wilderness after he was there for 40 years or so. And he said to me, God said to Moses, I allowed you to wander in the wilderness for these some 40 years to humble thee, to test thee, to see if you will serve me or not. Okay? He went before Pharaoh and requested the people to be let go 
so that they may worship the Lord our God. Pharaoh refused. He hardened his heart and began to oppress his people of Israel even more. Then began the cycle of the ten plagues. Moses requested that Pharaoh release his people, but Pharaoh continued to refuse. God sent a plague after plague after plague. He told God told him ahead of time what he was going to do to him. But Pharaoh didn't bother, he didn't listen. He continued to be disobedient to the word of God until his firstborn died. After the final plague, the death of his firstborn, Pharaoh finally agreed to let the children of Israel go. But then he had another change of heart and chased after them with his army. That's when the great scene of deliverance occurred as God parted the Red Sea, allowing the children of Israel to pass through safety first, but then drowning Pharaoh and his army under the sea after them. Now we may be tempted to think that this is a wonderful story of God's miraculous saving power on display and just leave it at that. However, we would be missing the bigger picture of the story of redemption if we did. The Old Testament prepares the way for the New Testament and all of God's promises find their yes and amen in Christ, 2 Corinthians 1.20. The exodus from Egypt through the real historical event prefigures the saving work of Christ and his people. You ain't seen nothing yet. What God did through Moses was to provide physical salvation from physical slavery. What God does through Christ is to provide spiritual salvation from a spiritual slavery. However, our salvation isn't like, uh, isn't like that of the Israelites in Egypt. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt, but we are all slaves to sin. The slave master is still after you, but somehow he lost his sin. As Jesus said to the Pharisees, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, John 8, 34, 36. The passing through the Red Sea is used as a symbol of the believer's identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, his crucifixion ain't have nothing on his resurrection. Come on, somebody talk to me. All that time that the Israelites was in slavery, and have nothing, nothing on their coming out. They came out more miraculous than they ever went in. God parted the Red Sea. First he brought the plagues on Pharaoh. Destroyed them and their household. And then he parted the Red Sea for them to cross over on dry land. Okay, God ain't got to prove nothing to us, but he does time and time again. And still yet, some of us still don't come to him for with repentance. Okay, the passing through the Red Sea is used as a symbol of the believers. I said that. The Apostle Paul says, For I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4. That's why what happened when God told Moses to speak to the rock, the rock was a form of Christ. And Moses hit the rock. So actually Moses was hitting Christ. And that's what set it off. Why Moses didn't get to see the promised land. Okay. Moses got angry finally because the people were complaining. But he just, he shouldn't have taken it personal. He should have remembered, hey, I'm doing a job. I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. This is not my battle. This is the Lord's. But he took it personal. He let it go to his head. And he forfeited his opportunity to see the promised land as a result. Paul, uh-oh, let's see now what happened here. <laughs> Paul is giving the exodus from Egypt. In the Christological reading, he is making the connection between the exodus from Egypt and salvation in Christ. Notice how Paul says, all were baptized unto Moses, just as the Israelites were buried before with him by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in the newness of life. Romans 6 4. God said he's going to do a new thing in each one of us and he also knows the plans that he has for us. The parting of the Red Sea not only finalized God's redemption of all people from slavery in Egypt but it also prefigured the greater spiritual reality of God's redemption. Okay, God's crucifixion, they had nothing on him coming out. 
The hell and hot water that you and I are going through ain't got nothing on us coming out. Our coming out is going to be far more greater than every, any trouble or hassle that we ever uh, uh, encountered or will encounter or are encountering. What the hell and hot water that we're going through? That's nothing compared to our coming out. <clears throat> our Red Sea that we have to cross on dry land. Come on, somebody talk to me. <clears throat> okay? Well, the parting of the Red Sea was finalized by God's redemption of his people from slavery to Egypt. But it also prefigured the greatest spiritual reality of God's redemption of his people. I said that before. I just wanted to reiterate it. From slavery to sin through the work of Christ. Okay? You can uh, read the Quest Study Bible for more reference on that. Now the greatest miracles in the Bible prove the greatest and the power, the greatest, the greatness and the power of God. Okay, like I said, God ain't got to prove nothing, but he does time and time again. He shows us his greatness and his miraculousness. So that we will know that he is the Lord thy God and that we will come to him with repentance and not with a hardened heart. So that we can learn how to be obedient to the word of God and be blessed and not cursed. <coughs> you are the God who perform, performs miracles. You display your power among the people. Psalm 77, 14. A miracle, okay, can be classified as yeah, an unusual manifestation of God's power. Or, you know, some people call it, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know, they, people, a lot of people give it different names. But never hardly do you ever see them talking about that's a miracle of God. That's God's work right there. You know, they, what they call it, um, it's freak of nature or something like that. They call it sometimes, you know, come on, Mother Nature, <laughs> you know. Uh, but a miracle can be classified as a manifestation of God's wonder-working power in which he intervenes in human affairs and he shows us. You might see it in another human being. Uh, they've seen it in me. People have seen it in me, but they don't say nothing. They've seen God's miracle, miraculous power in me. Okay? Uh, miracles display God's power, inspire wonder, and act as signs that prove who God is and substantiate his message to the world. You know, a miracle is a supernatural event that reveals and or confirms a specific divine message. A lot of times God is getting a message across. I want you to know that I'm the Lord. I, there's none before me, there's none after me. There's none below me, there's none above me, there's none over there, over there. Okay, if you don't get it right with me, then you ain't got a chance. You have to get it right with the Lord in order to be able to have a chance at salvation, have a chance at peace, have a chance at... Uh, uh, at eternal salvation rather than eternal damnation. And you're not going to just live your life any kind of way you want and then think you can go to heaven. Or live your life any kind of way you want and then you go to hell. No, you're going to be prepared for your kingdom whichever way you go. While you're on earth. If you're going to hell, you're going to be prepared for your hellbound kingdom. You're going to live a life exempt, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a representative of hell. <laughs> of hell. <laughs> you're going to have masses over you and controlling you like the devil would be. Telling you what to do. You ain't going to have no peace. You ain't going to have no no uh, solace at all. Your life is going to be hell on wheels. Because you're being prepared for your hellbound kingdom. On the other hand, if you're heaven bound, you're going to be prepared for your heaven bound kingdom. You're going to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. You're going to experience God's wonder, work, and power. His blessings. And all of the benefits that come with being obedient to his word. Just look at Pharaoh. What happened to him? His whole household was destroyed. And even his child had to die. Because he refused to let God's people go. Okay? Uh, now, the children of Israel saw many miracles in the wilderness, journeys to the promised land, yet they still complained and bickered. These events were included in some of the greatest miracles in the Bible, confirmed to them that, were, uh, that they were followed, that they were following the one true and living God. <clears throat> he is your promise, He is your God who performed for you. Those great and awesome wonders, you saw you with your own eyes. Deuteronomy 10, 21. It confirms and reveals his specific divine and perfect message. Messages. Lists of the greatest miracles of the Bible would differ depending on whom you ask. <clears throat> okay, but they're all the same. Okay, the greatest miracle in the Bible, the time the sun stood still for Joshua. Joshua 10, 12 to 14. It's the parting of the Red Sea, which we're talking about here today. In Exodus 14, 
It is the movement of the sun's shadow back with 10 steps in Isaiah 38, 7 through 8. Come on, somebody talk to me up in here. You know, we don't serve no weak God or no unintelligent God. <clears throat> the resurrection of Christ in Matthew 2, 8, uh, 28, 1 through 8. The feeding of 5,000, Mark 6, 35, 44, with two fish and five loaves of bread. Don't try this at home, y'all. <laughs> but how many of y'all know? How many, how many times do you think you can go to the store and buy two fish and five loaves of bread and feed 5,000 people? Come on, you can't do it. Only God can. Or somebody attached to or connected with the man, the master. You know, you'll never have to worry about any food on your table. If you serve God, you not, might not be able to serve, uh, serve or feed 5,000, but you can show it up feed you and your family for maybe 5,000 years and generations and generations to come. Y'all never have to worry about no food, not putting no food on your table. Or maybe the greatest of miracle in the Bible is the creation of you. Creation of you. Creation of you. Creation of you. And me. The cause could be made that the greatest miracle in the Bible of the crossing of the Red Sea. The scope and the historical significance of that miracle are truly awesome, and that event is often pointed to by other biblical writers as proof of God's power and His goodness. For example, Joshua 24, 6, Nehemiah 9, 11, Psalm 66, 6, Psalms 36, 13, Isaiah 43, 16, Isaiah 51, 15, uh, Hebrews 11 and 29. Just as strong men, just as strong a case can be made for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus without which our faith is futile in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And the miracle of the sun and the moon standing still is truly a sight to see. Any miracle by definition is great. Any miracle at all. Anything that happens. The fact that you and I are still standing here today is a miracle. The fact that we still be able to see another day, another sunrise, that's a miracle within itself. Okay? The enemy tried, but they did not try up over me or you. You don't know what could have been lurking in the dark, waiting for you somewhere, that God blocked. Okay, all the times that you thought that you were betrayed, please, that was nothing compared to what God blocked and He saw before it came to you. He blocked mostly all of it. All you saw was a little smidgen of what was to come. But He moved you right out of the way. That was a miracle by itself. God performs miracles every day of our lives. Just by allowing us to be alive is a miracle. The fact that all the hell and high water that we done been through, it didn't take us out of here and we still standing. We got beauty for ashes, but all the joy for mourning, and the spirit of praise for happiness. Come on, somebody talk to us. We still happy and joyful, and the enemy can't understand. How is it that I didn't destroy her life and all of the hell that I put her through? And now, the grave that you dug, you are being buried in it. Come on, somebody talk to me. Any miracle by definition is definitely a miracle to behold because it's a miracle that's performed by God now the Lord said to Moses as you probably already know okay why are you crying to me get moving go ahead on and do it like I said before in my other messages it's already done tell the people to get going you gotta keep it moving baby you can't stand still you can't get stuck because if you get stuck, you ain't going to go nowhere. You ain't going to be able to go nowhere. You ain't going to do nothing. You ain't going to get nothing done. You got to keep it moving. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your position is in life or in the world. Or with your family or your friends or what have you. Or who you, where you think you are at. Or where you think you're not at. You got to keep it moving. Because otherwise, you're going to stop your unburied skeleton. That's what you're going to become. You're going to be like the Valley of Dry Bones. Whether God resurrects you or not and lets the winds come from the north, east, south, and the west to blow winds into your bones again and let you become a great army, that's another story. You don't know that. But we do know what's in the word of God. God hardened the heart of the Egyptians and of Israel. He did it on purpose. He knew what he was doing. Okay? He knew exactly what he was doing. God knows what he's doing. Okay? 
Uh, and I'm going to conclude with uh, one scripture, which is maybe two. <laughs> okay, and let's see what we got here. Okay, the Lord spoke to Elijah and told him to leave and go hard. How many of y'all know that God has his reasons for telling us what we need to do? It's up to us to be obedient to his word. Elijah did as God commanded him to do, and in chapter 5 it says, The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, because he ran and ran and ran, and he wanted God to take his life. But God had a plan for Elijah. And he says, I'm not taking you out of here, baby. I got to show you some things. Here's another miracle being performed. <laughs> Come on, somebody talk to me. So, when the brook dried up, my baby went to the widow. Okay, and the widow had more than enough to eat for the rest of her life. She thought she was going to die. See, we got to remember, the God, you know, when, when we get at our lowest point, our lowest common denominator, God loves it because then he can step in. And we trust him by faith. He loves it when we have faith in him. And when we can say, you know what, I trust you, Lord, no matter what. Yet though they slay me, yet will I serve you. You know, I may not see a way, but I know you're making a way out of no way, Lord. I know this valley of dry bones will live again. And they will become a great army. Why? Because you said so in your word. And I know it's already done. So I'm thanking you because it's already done in the name of Jesus. I'm thanking you because it's already done. Thanking you, God, for what you're doing, what you've done, and what you're going to do. Thank you, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. This is this is a good story, right? <laughs> there been mo many movies have been made out of this. Okay, many movies. So I'm going to conclude with that and uh, tell you that everybody has a red seat across, my brothers and sisters. Everybody has a red seat across. I have a red seat across, and so do you. Do you. Do you. Do you. Do you. Do you. So I want to ask you to join me next week. I want you to holler at the system. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black. I'm licensed real estate broker with the rooms and apartments. And I'm licensed to preach and I'm a minister. And I have my license, uh, I'm Dr. Sylvia Black. I have a PhD in sacred biblical studies. And I want to thank you for joining me today. And I'm available for public engagements. I'm also a psalmist, I sing. And you can listen to some of my tapes, some of my poetry and everything like that. And just holler at the system. Just listen to my messages and you should be blessed. And I will see you next time on Wednesday Beach. And, 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 and,